You're listening to The Dental Guys. When's the last time you checked your tonsils out? This week on The Dental Guys, John and I discuss an interesting article that has really validated how we're looking at children and their growth patterns. And it's going to affect the way that you look at your next patient this week on The Dental Guys. When the dental guys need an infection prevention product, we turn to Kerr and their Total Care line. Kerr has been an industry leader in infection control and prevention products for years. And when we think of infection control, Cavicide and Cavi wipes are the first things that come out of our minds. It's automatic and there's a reason for that. Kerr knows dentistry and their products work. The dental guys trust Kerr products in our offices and you should too. Stay safe with Kerr Total Care. Looking for a lab that understands the bridge between art and science? Check out the Dental Crafters Network. Dental Crafters, one relationship, infinite possibilities. Contact them at 1-800-472-8302 or at dentalcrafters.net. Do you want to learn to predictably place and restore dental implants using the most modern science and technology? We are talking 60 hours of CE in a comprehensive curriculum and live surgical implant placement on pre-selected patients. Head over to RestorativeDrivenImplants.com to learn more today. And welcome to this week's episode of The Dental Guys. I'm Wes, The Dental Guy. And I'm John, The Dental Guy. And Wes, it is another fun week. I'll tell you, we made it through the end of the year in 2020. We're into 2021. It doesn't feel that different. It really doesn't feel that different. I mean, I got my second dose of the vaccine. That's all I know. I was getting ready to say, like, I've scheduled mine for this Thursday. I feel like Superman. Like, I feel like I'm waiting to see what superpower I get. Still haven't felt it yet, but. There's all these discussions around when, when you should get it, you know, which one you should get, right? Yep. What the efficacy is. And um, I think it's awesome. I think it's pretty awesome tech. Um, I think it's interesting what has been, what has came out of this is innovation, you know? Oh, yeah. And um, some amazing things and some terrible things, obviously. But despite talking about COVID, let's talk about ham radio, John. (laughs) (laughs) There's no easy segue from that to that, but I'll take it. Let's tell me about it. Oh, If you're watching the video version, you will see that Wes actually has some type of radio in his hand right now. Yeah, talk to me. This is the Baofeng BF8 Baofeng. Okay. Okay. It happens to be a U.S. designed um, radio um, for less than a hundred bucks. Okay. You can purchase this uh, BF F8 HP. Bow fang. Do you have to be a ham radio operator? To activate, if you push this little red button, as you see on the screen right here, John, you yeah. better. <laughs> what happens? You better have, because you're transmitting if you do that. You now, have to have a license? You have to have a license to transmit. Now, I will say this. is. Uh, do you have a license? Hold on. I don't have a license yet. Uh-oh. Okay? I'm not transmitting. I'm not transmitting. I'm listening. I'm okay, listening. you're just listening. He's just listening. And I am. I am going to take my my technical license. I, I'm. I'll, I'm. It depends on whether I want to get my general or not. But I'm going to start with my technical. But John, do you remember back a few years back, whenever I got into first person view, right? FPV, uh-huh. right? Uh, Drones, right? That has. That is. That has not stopped. That has not, not stopped. It is still going on. You're going to have to explain to me how these things connect because well, I don't te- understand. Technically, right? You to operate a drone in the United States, first person view, um, and even some of the other drones, right, that are on a certain frequency that is um, falls under the FCC communications. Um, bandwidth that is allowed for public transmission, uh, really you're supposed to have, according to some newer laws, a actual ham technical 
level license. Now, oh, the technician's really? level, right, is the entry level to ham. Okay. Now, that allows you certain um, basic things you can do. You can transmit. Um, and I, I'm, I'm very, very green. Okay. I'm just okay. now starting to read a little bit about these things. You can't, you can't even buy. Right here's the interesting thing: you can't, you can buy a ham radio right now, okay, mm -hmm. but you can't buy even the book that I'm wanting from Gordon West. Uh, Gordon West is a famous ham radio guy um, that's been around for years, but he has written um, many books on how to get your license, basically study guides, CDs, audio is things it you can hard? listen to. Actually, uh, the technical in general probably is not as hard as you would think because all of the questions are available. Okay. okay. So, so I mean, this is something that you study for out of a book mm -hmm. and then you take the test. Like, where do you take the test? Is it online? Well, right now, because of COVID, it is being divvied up online um, okay. in some fashion. Not sure about that, but it used to now, be. Hold on. Would... Now, hold on a second. What? Why is what I want to know. Okay. So you have the radio. Okay. Right. You have the ability to transmit. What is it about transmitting that is cool? So why do people opinion. get into ham radio? That's what I want to, I want to understand it. Right. I mean, the, in the, in the so, remaining one or so, one or two minutes we have here before we go <laughs> talk about the dental topic. The, the appeal for myself is the cool factor of uh, when the old cell phone, right, which is very unreliable communications, right? <clears throat> very okay. unreliable. How reliable are cell phones? Well, people complain about them every day. When they right. don't work, ham is so simple that it still works, right? And um, there is an appeal without getting into things that we don't really need to talk about. I'm not a prepper in any way, shape or form. Really, I'm not. I mean, I do prepare things in ways that we should prepare, but I'm not, I don't have a bunker. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but if that's what you're trying to dig out of me, I don't have that. And I'm glad to say that on the show. Well, no, I mean, I'm not judging. I'm just trying to understand like the appeal of ham, because like you say, it's basically you can talk and how, and you can talk to people how far away. Around the world. You could talk to around you could talk world. around the world because with ham we can do all kinds of things, right? We can actually send packets of data. You can actually use email. You can send information. Mm. When the internet is down, you can actually operate a community bulletin board system. If you know what we're talking about there, back in yeah. the early, late eighties, early nineties, yeah. community yeah. bulletin boards. That is all can be operated by radio frequency. The interesting thing is is that with this radio right here hooked up to a repeater right mm -hmm. and a repeater is a you know like a base station on top of like a mountain you can yeah. transmit this miles and miles away just this right walkie talkie per se has the power okay to communicate communicate three to four miles right wow and and that's that's less than a hundred bucks Right. Hmm. Then you pair that up with like a base station, something that you spend probably less than a thousand dollars with a very good antenna. And now we're talking about being able to with repeaters, being able to talk to people around the world. So I will say, I mean, this is what you get when you're friends with West Mullins, because I mean, we've heard about bees. We've heard about <laughs> hey, kombucha. Bees are doing we've great. Heard we heard we've heard about now ham radio so wes knows a lot about a lot and that's why i like him he doesn't know a lot about a little and he doesn't know a little about a lot he knows a lot about a lot and that i totally respect so with that in mind guys we have a really great show guys and girls we've been talking over the years you guys know if you followed our journey we have talked a lot about airway <clears throat> we've talked a lot about sleep medicine We've talked a lot about how you implement this into your practice, which is, as Wes would say, is one of the hardest things we've ever done, if not probably the hardest. And we're not going to talk about airway and sleep so much today, but we're not going to talk about sleep. Mm -mm. But we're going to talk a little bit about how in our practices we are examining people and how and why we should examine people a certain way. And I know you're thinking, 
if you're not doing sleep, if you're not doing airway, you're like, oh, Lord, oh, here they go again, right? But I'm telling you, if you go to any treatment plan and continuum now, they're going to be talking about this. They're going to be talking about why it matters where if you have a patient that shows certain patterns of wear, certain things, you better pay attention to this. Mm. And that's in adults, but we're going to be talking about kids as well and how developmental changes affect how they become adults. So stay tuned with us right after a word from our sponsor. It's going to be a great show. So we'll be right back. Hi, I'm Justin Goodbray with Financially Simple. So perhaps you're considering buying your first practice or your second, third, or fourth. Here's a tip for you. Planning your new business is an exhausting and time-consuming process, but trust me, it's worth the effort. Be intentional, though, in the location of your new practice. Just like in real estate investing, location matters. Greater foot or vehicle traffic could mean more patience, but it could also mean greater competition and price compression. As you examine your potential location, make sure to weigh the pros and cons. If you're not sure how to do this, reach out to us and we'll be glad to help. For more information about this and other dental related topics, visit financiallysimple.com forward slash dentist. This tip is for informational purposes only. Please speak with a competent financial advisor regarding your specific needs. Justin Goodbread is a registered investment advisor with Heritage Investors. Visit heritageinvestor.com, financiallysimple.com for additional information. All right, we're back. Here we are. So if you hung in through the ham radio conversation, you learned a lot. I did. I know I did. And here we are at the main topic. And Wes, this is really one you kind of drove. I mean, I want you to talk about kind of what we're going to be talking about today. Kind of give us the intro. Why? What are we talking about today? Why does it matter for somebody who might just be a quote unquote regular dentist mm. who's just looking at this whole airway piece and, uh, you know, sleep medicine, and they're trying to figure out how to fit this into their practice. And then maybe why does this matter for your orthodontist, your specialist, you know, let's just kind of give us an outline about what we're talking about and why it matters. So as a dentist, being able to recognize the growth and development patterns of the jaws um, from birth to adulthood and then understanding what you're seeing as adult and how you can impact that growth and development um, in your children patients or your uh, pediatric patients um, one of the articles that i reference here not so much for the article itself but what it says in the very first line right the article comes from the AJODO, which is an amazing um, journal, American Association of Orthodontists. This is the article itself published in 2017, if you'd like this, Relationships Among Nasal Resistance, Adenoids, Tonsils, and Tongue Posture, and Maxillofacial Form in Class 2 and Class 3 Children. Okay, now we're not really going to go into the results of this. You can look that up yourself. But what I want us to, to, to talk about today is how we're examining and what are we looking at. And so it, it, it references some of the pioneers, okay, in the very first line, the pioneers of orthodontic development and orthodontist and how we believe that the face forms and how it's developed, right? And if mm -hmm. you understand a little, just a little about development, right? Yep. You can begin to see why people have some of the symptoms, okay? And why they show some of the signs, right, of developmental problems. It says right here, I quote, maxillofacial form in the very first line is influenced by both genetic and environmental factors. Okay. So there are genetic pressures, meaning dad and mom are passing on things to our children, right? Yep. That influence the growth and development. Okay. Now on top of that, right, we have this thing called right environmental factors right what are those right 
there's a whole host of things. And then on mm-hmm. top of that, this article goes on to explain that there are myofunctional factors that can affect. That means the muscle, right? We've always heard in dentistry that muscle always wins over bone, right? So environmental mm. factors, genetic factors, you know, you've got basically a multifactorial thing that there's a lot of variables that influence growth and development. So what does our examination look like of this growth and development and the yeah. factors that are influencing it, John? Right? That's the question here. Okay. So the way that we've set up our examinations in our office is to look at three subsets of people. Okay. And basically during these subsets, certain things are happening. Okay. And certain things could be affecting the growth and development of person. Okay. Mm -hmm. So for instance, let's start with the first group, John birth to two. Mm -hmm. Now I would never have said even five, maybe not five years ago, maybe 10 years ago that I would be wanting to see children and influence a parent's, um, I don't know, decision-making process, basically, and, and prescribing treatment or prescribing things to influence the growth and development of a zero plus one day old child, right? Mm -hmm. I I never would have done that. And in fact, we used to call our first visit to the dentist a happy visit. I don't know how happy it was, John, but we would would never even charge for this. But now because we're offering so much, right, information, and we're actually doing an examination on a zero to two-year-old, Um, we're actually charging a comprehensive exam. Hmm. And you might think, well, that's hogwash, right? Well, what are we looking for? Well, we really didn't start charging for the exam until we got our our I's dotted and our T's crossed and we truly understood the multifactorial process Mm -hmm. of what we were seeing and how it was being, how the body was being influenced by all these factors, John. Right. And Is so, not- so let me just, so let me stop you there for a second. So let's kind of back up a little bit for those of you who are, again, maybe new to this idea. If you followed us over the years, you've, you've heard us talk about how, you know, we've tried to figure out what matters in terms of predictable dentistry. Okay. So let's That's start right. with that <clears throat> because when we went out to say spear education and we went to treatment planning courses and workshops and we kept hearing this thing come up that you know you better pay attention to patterns of of wear that was how it started Mm. and if airway is an issue then we're going to need to do some things totally differently in the way that you uh treatment plan these patients so then the question became well how do you change that in adults because that was kind of what we thought about the most like if we're going to be doing reconstructive dentistry we better know how to fix it versus just, I mean, you could either fix it, right? Resolve it as we talk about, or you can try to control it, or you can just try to, you know, put stronger stuff on a tooth and hope it doesn't break. Right. So then you start to back up and go, okay, well, if we're seeing this problem in adults and it's significant, what can we do about kids? What can we do to keep this from developing into a problem? And the very first thing you got to be able to do is a good exam. Because if you can do a good exam, you know what you're looking for, then you're on the right track. It's a start. So this is why we have developed in our practices this protocol of trying to examine the right things at the right time. And this article that that we're talking about is so important because it basically correlates the way that anatomy, if you will, uh, affects development. And the fact that if you look at, you know, the, the relationship between how people breathe, their adenoids or tonsils or tongue posture, and you look at whether they become class two or class three over time, you can absolutely correlate it. You can absolutely correlate it. So our job is we have to identify that and we have to stop it from becoming a problem because That's right. again, if you're just a regular dentist, who says, I want to put a crown on number eight because it keeps breaking. 
because I can't you know? own my composite on. Right. It keeps the composites broken four times. Yeah, or five times. It's the bonding. The bonding I'm using is crap, right? Right. I need to I need to, a better cement, right? Right. Well, if you if you start really diving down into the why, you start to discover that oftentimes it's really a problem with wear patterns. And if the wear pattern is caused by airway, well, why is the airway happening? And what if we could stop this when these are, you know, these kids are growing up? So I just give you that little bit of background to say, this is how we got to this point. You know, we didn't just, we're not just trying to like show you that we know about this stuff. Like it has messed with us for years. And we finally got to a point where we said, okay, we got to understand the relationship. And this article I think is one of the best ones to illustrate what the correlation is between a class two patient, a class three patient, and what we actually see with the airway. So Wes, let's dive into it, man. Let's talk about this article. What does it say? How does it correlate airway and our findings we might have on say a CT scan mm. or an examination intraorally, a nasal examination, maybe even an ENT examination. Mm. How yeah, does this correlate with what we're actually seeing in the mouth with class two, class three type of growth pattern? Well, so this article references uh, McNamara and Profit from like 1980, okay, mm. 1977. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, I found out a little bit about these guys, okay? One of them died of sleep apnea and had tried to correct it. The other one was on CPAP the last time that uh, the orthodontist told me said, but the other one mm. had had to try to go through some corrective surgery, whether it was RME or whatever, um, and um, to try to help fix the airway problem that, this, that, that he had, okay? So it's interesting, though, that the frustrations they had in the development and identifying, like, is there really a relationship between nasal clarity and some of these malocclusions or these skeletal problems that we're seeing, right? Well, now we have some interesting things available to us. We have the ability to use cone beam tomography and with volumetric analysis. And I actually happened to take this same article to our airway study club in the past week and we had an oral radiologist who had reviewed this and mm. she found this article to be founded and she found the methods that they were using to calculate airway resistance in these patients to be excellent and basically mm. what they did is they used modern tools to evaluate the resistance in amongst these patients that have skeletal class two and skeletal class three. And then what it does is it says, well, what's the incidence of tongue posture problems, right? Tonsillar problems, meaning tonsillar hypertrophy or not, okay, or yep. adenoid hypertrophy, right? And, and there was an incidence there, John, right? I mean, there was a correlation between these skeletal relationships and... Uh, nasal resistance, nasal resistance of a class two group was significantly larger than a class three, meaning like that if you're a class two posture, you're more mm -hmm. likely to have resistance in the airway, right? Now we know that the upper jaw, right? The maxilla, okay? This is what we know about the maxilla. As the maxilla grows, it is the yep. driver, Right. And the passenger, which is hanging down here, right below the maxilla, right, is going to grow to the development of the maxilla. The mandible is growing to the development of the maxilla. So what does right. it develop? Yeah, the maxilla determines kind of everything. Right. So if a patient is class two, we automatically know to turn the mirror around. Right. Yep. And I guarantee you their palate's small and they got a high vaulted palate or they got a palate that has a narrow measurement, Rich. And we know that anything less than, let's just say 37, which is a cotton roll between the first yep. molars, okay, first permanent molars, 37 millimeters, anything less than that is considered to be narrow and not within normal limits. These patients, right, they had nasal resistance. Yep. Okay. Now, are you looking for nasal resistance in your practice now? Right? Because we are. There's a thing called... Yeah, you have to. You, until you start 
building a knowledge base of what nasal resistance looks like, you really mm-hmm. don't know what nasal... Like the first time I took my thumb and turned up the tip of the nose and took my LED light and shined up inside and looked at the turbinate, the septum, I really didn't know what I was looking at. But I just yep. kept looking, right? And then I started evaluating what stenosis is, right? It's where you pinch one side of the nose off and actually have the patient breathe. And there's all kinds of ways we can get into details of the exam at another time. But the question is, is are you looking at nasal resistance, right? Because isn't it interesting, John, if you see a class two patient, right? The, you can automatically know that this patient is probably got a high incidence of nasal resistance. And therefore, if they have nasal resistance, they're going to be more congested. Yep. Right. They're going to be more likely to mouth breathe. They're going to be more likely to have tonsillar hypertrophy (laughs) because they are mouth breathing. And so then you start to ask these patients these questions. How often do you battle allergies? Mm. Right. Why are your gums red? Just the hygienist knowing some of these things. Why does this patient have no plaque on their teeth and their gums are red all the time? Yep. Right. Right. So you start to think about mouth breathing. (laughs) You start to think about skeletal problems. You start to think about this. And so, you know, what we're trying to make a case for from this is you have to be looking at it. You know, you have to be looking at it. And, you know, if you look at, if you, you know, if you hear what this oral maxillofacial radiologist said is the way they're measuring this is legit. You know, Mm -hmm. you're looking at comb beam CT and we, a lot of, a lot of us now, so a couple of years ago, Wes, we started really talking about this. A lot of, we know a lot of dentists didn't have cone beam CT. That's right. And so this was something that we were kind of like trying to push people to do. You know, we reviewed cone beam CT machines way back then. We said, Hey, you mm-hmm. need to have the access to this in your practice. And so I think that the, the first level is just understanding that oftentimes if you're just looking in the mouth, if you're just looking at the airway, there's a correlation between what's happening with adenoids. So, so let me let me put it this way. All right, because I think this is kind of what messed with me with this article. You know, if you don't have comium CT in your practice, mm-hmm. okay, and you're just doing examinations of the airway of the mouth of the face, and you see a class two patient in, in a, a kid. <clears throat> If you looked at the CT, what this article is saying is there'd be a correlation between the CT findings, most likely, and some of the problems you're seeing when you do a complete airway examination. But the same thing goes the opposite way. If you just saw CBCT, if you just if you're just an oral maxillofacial radiologist, you just saw CBCT, you didn't see the kid, and you saw tonsil problems, adenoid problems, tongue posture problems on the CT you would also be able to pretty much predict that if you did the airway examination on the same patient, you'd be able to see the problems. So I just want you to kind of put that together. You know, if you don't have CT, this is saying you can kind of predict what you're going to see on a CT. But if you have both, super powerful, right? Because you can see the airway findings in the mouth, correlate that to the CT, and we can feel pretty confident now after an article like this saying that, there's a correlation. And I like the fact that we really can look at the tongue posture difference, right? You have tonsil size mm-hmm. of the class three patients correlated directly with tongue posture. Yep. And we have incisor position also correlated with that. And we've got mandibular protrusion that is correlated mm-hmm. with that tongue posture in the class three patient. Now, I know that a lot of times you think, okay, okay, the class three, I'm not so worried about from an airway perspective. We're just worried about them more from a growth perspective. So, okay, cool. So worry about them. But the class two is the one we're worried about in every possible way, right? We're worried about them from a development standpoint, an airway standpoint, width standpoint. These are people we can really help. The class three patient that we can talk about, the class three patient, Wes, I'm finding they're hard. They're very hard. They're hard. hard. They're very difficult because because you're width trying, is easier than length. It is so much easier to gain width than length, right? Yeah, especially I mean, especially when they're young. Yes. You know? 
So I just don't feel like I have as many options. I mean, I know I have options, but I don't have as, as many options outside of surgical options in a class three patient. But in a class two patient, if I can put these things together, nasal resistance, if I can look mm. at tongue posture, you know, if I can then correlate that with what's going on at home, mm -hmm. with their sleep habits, their patterns, mm -hmm. with wear, things like that, I can start to build a case where I can say, there's so much we can do for these class two patients if we catch them early. It's, in, it's really one of the things that I think that I see a lot is this thought, pro thought process that I have to have a CT machine to be able to make an airway diagnosis, mm. right? And that's not the case here, right? Mm -hmm. That's not what we're saying. What we're saying is, is that the signs that we're seeing clinically, right? Yep. Are, are really backed up by the CT, okay? And it's telling us something. It's telling us that, oh, okay, that does make sense, right? And, and if you don't have a CT, right, you don't need a CT to be able to understand and see the problems that we're talking about. Okay. Now, John, I know recently that you had your hygienist reach out to me, uh, reach out to one of my team members who is myofunctional therapist because you're interested in myofunctional therapy which is yeah. essentially tongue posture, right? Absolutely. It is, it is the function of the muscle which can affect essentially the bones of the mouth, right? Now we're right. talking about something here in a very young age that could affect, you know, the growth and development of a child, right? Yep. But this article even correlates jaw position to tongue posture, Right. I think as what time goes on, we were told by um, many people over the past five years that myofunctional therapy has its place, but we yet don't know where it's going to land. Right. Yeah. But the longer that I'm practicing, John, <laughs> the more I see that it is it has its place somewhere in dentistry. Right. Or in yep. somewhere in treatment of these patients. And what we didn't know a long time ago was how important, actually what we did know, interestingly enough, that tongue posture was important, but it was that some of the ideas back in the beginning of myofacial form and how it happens and how the development of the skeleton happens, it's just really kind of been a gray area, yep. right? And more data is coming out and more technology is allowing us to look at these things and showing that, you know what, what they were doing back in the day, they actually kind of knew what they were talking about. Some of these, yeah. you know, trailblazers in ortho. It's true. That's true. So I, I, I think that what I'm taking from this, you know, is, you know, first of all, we could feel confident to kind of hang our hat on this, which is something that, you know, for years, I, I, I'm, we're, I mean, I feel like, again, some of you guys listening to this might be like, yeah, I've known this for years. I've been doing this. But I think if you really are struggling to figure out how to put this all together, if you very, if you at very least can just say, okay, I know how to correlate what I'm seeing in the mouth with what I probably are going to see in the development of this kid going forward. And I can maybe get ahead of this problem. And I can train, and the ideal, like Wes said, is to actually train somebody or to have a myofunctional therapist who can work on, not just because, you know, there's one approach to this, Wes, and it's surgical, right? It's to say, adenoids, tonsils, we need to deal with it. And sometimes surgery is the way to go. The other way is to deal with, you know, talking to sleep physicians, if we see problems with airway that result in sleep disturbances. And that's all determined through our exam and discussing this with the parents. But the third way there that I think that I'm becoming more and more and more dependent on is myofunctional therapy because so much of what we can do is accomplished through figuring out how to get the tongue in the right place and the kid breathing through their nose. And so if you don't have any experience with myofunctional therapy, you need to dive into it. You need to look at it. You might not have somebody in your area. It's super difficult sometimes in some areas. I haven't had somebody for a long time until recently. And 
you know, it's very challenging because this is, this is a part of your practice that it can be very rewarding because you can, you can change lives of some of these kids and, and their parents are super, super thankful and grateful, but it's a lot of work and you have to know how to deal with the business side of it as well. So I think I look at this side, this kind of article and I think, all right, well, this gives me the justification to say, I need to, I need to know about this. I can, I can feel justified in implementing it in my practice, but still a long road ahead. You know, you have to be willing to put together as Wes and I've talked about, you have to have a team. You got to have an ENT that you can trust who understands this stuff. You really need to sit down and talk to an ear, nose and throat doctor about this article. And you really mm -hmm. probably need an orthodontist in the room because the ear, nose and throat doctor might not know what a class two class three means. Maybe they do. Maybe they don't. Orthodontist needs to interpret that for them. And then you really ideally need to have somebody else in the room, a myofunctional therapist, who can say, I know how to I know how to work with tongue posture. Because if some if a kid has been, if you will, trained by their nasal resistance, by their anatomy, by their adenoids, by their tonsils, to put their tongue in the wrong place, you can't just take the adenoids and tonsils out and expect that's going to resolve completely. In fact, the research says that it won't get any better. Right. Uh, can you imagine going through all of this and you don't get better because you just don't know how to train the tongue to be in the right place again? So mm -hmm. what we're saying is you have to have a team. And I think it starts with a good ENT and a good orthodontist. I think that's a start. We've kind of determined that over the years, if you have a good mm -hmm. ENT, you have a good orthodontist and you do a good examination. You can you can fix a lot of this and you have to have a sleep physician, obviously, that you can refer to for the issues that are outside of what you can do with surgery or orthodontics. Mm -hmm. um, but myofunctional therapy, increasingly, it's been messing with me, Wes. Yeah, that's why. Because I need somebody that can do this. Because this article would be good for you. See, now you asked me that question the other day. I was like, you know what? Mm -hmm. Mm. mess with me it's messing yeah. with me so the, the interesting thing here is like you're going to meet resistance right when trying to create your team you know it's not easy the other day uh there's a person that i've referred to for years i respect him as a colleague he's taught me a lot about orthodontics he's an orthodontist and his associate is an orthodontist and you know um we had a patient that um was we thought you know it's off uh, we didn't think it's obvious that there are skeletal problems. And basically we sent a letter back saying, Hey, we, this is, you're treating this patient or in the midst of treating or in between phase one and phase two or whatever. Right. And we've noticed these things. Yep. And it was just like a list, right. From an exam sheet. Yep. Right. And the, and the parent comes back and we said, hey, did you ever talk to them about that? And they said, well, yeah. They said, well, that's just a different way of looking at development. That's mm -hmm. one thought. Uh, we, believe that the, we believe the child will just grow out of it. And, mm. and I think that's, that's kind of the classic thought process that has been taught and is still being taught to a certain extent actually to a greater extent in orthodontic programs. Uh, speaking to a young orthodontist the other day, I asked the question, I said, so in all of your training, uh, what do you know about the factors that influence growth and development? Yep. And the answer that I got was crickets. Really, huh. they just said it was multifactorial. I'm like, well, what factors? And he and and I'm, and I mean I'm not making fun of him because he's a great orthodontist. He's learning and he's a, a, interested in what we're talking about. Sure, and he's sure. Very, very moldable at this stage, but he didn't have an answer. And I'm like, well, how can you be an orthodontist, right? And I, I'm calling on orthodontists right now, right? Just yep. like Dan German said, he's an orthodontist, and we interviewed him a year or so, two years ago almost. And he said that it's really our responsibility to be the experts in growth and development. Yes, and I, which and is a real challenge. It's a very it's a it's a it's a hard challenge to to propose because there's a lot of pressure to produce straight teeth from the parent, right? And this type of 
a conversation, <coughs> excuse me, this type of conversation that you're having with the parent is difficult. It takes time. Uh, the, pedi uh, the pediatricians don't have time for it with their, with the, with the, the uh, patients, the pedodontists seem to be very resistant to start having these conversations. At least in my area, they 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 just kind of shrug their shoulders, like uh, uh, you know. And yeah, there's this resistance. And what I would say, if you're interested in just knowing more about how to identify some of the things that we're talking about and how to better understand it, and you're trying to build a team, just keep pushing. And here's why because the evidence is going to become harder to ignore. We are yeah. not seeing any evidence against what we are saying. We're yeah. not. We're yeah. not. In fact, we're seeing more people like Prophet, one of the fathers of orthodontics, and McNamara being proven right. And so when you see stuff that was written 30, 40 years ago, that is actually being kind of validated, right? Yeah. That's the dental guy's way, right, John? That's the dental guy's way of changing your practice. Absolutely. It's a practice changer. And I think that that's something that's a very difficult practice changer because this is not so simple as buying a product. It's not so simple as, you know, a little CE course you go to. This is a... This is a big change, but it starts with the examination. It starts with knowing, first of all, knowing what you need to know, knowing what's important to look at, and then implementing that daily. And I think your hygienist can do a lot of this for you. You know, you can come in and validate, but a hygienist really that understands the importance of this can make a big difference. So, you know, this is challenging to me. It's been challenging to me. It's been challenging. We've talked about it for a couple of years, but we want you guys to know that this is something that's really making a difference in our practices. Um, so if you're enjoying this, you know, if this is something that is helping you to change the way you think about things, I think that's what the Dental Guys has been doing for the last few years now. It's crazy to think it's been several years, Wes. I mean, it's crazy. So if this is helping you to change your practice and become a better dentist, a better doctor, a better better person when it comes to to challenging yourself to to learn to get to the next level please let us know give us a positive review give us a five-star review in apple podcast let us know on social media channels let us know what you're enjoying what you like about what we're talking about tell us how this article is changing the way you look at your daily dentistry because that's really what it's all about we're always looking at ourselves the same as you which is hey we are just regular dentists but we're trying to always elevate our game take our practice to the next level. So hit us up on social media, like our sponsors, give us, give them some love for supporting us. Tell other people about the dental guys, tell them about what you learned, tell them about how it's changing your practice. And we look forward to continue to bringing you content like this at a high level to always take things to the next level. So for Wes, I'm John and we are the dental guys. <laughs>